Hi everyone, this is Miss Alice with my second at home learning video. Um, this is meant to follow the first and it would help with the higher order thinking skills that we're gonna work on. It would help if you had watched the first one already. <clears throat> Sorry, so if you have not yet watched and participated in what do you do with a tale like this, Maybe pause here, take a moment, go back, watch that one, have that conversation with your children, and then come back. Today, we're gonna to be reading another book uh, by the same author. So this is also, oh, over here, it's also by Steve Jenkins and Robin Page. This one is called, How Many Ways Can You Catch a Fly? Now, just like this other, story, other book we've read, this is an informational nonfiction, so <clears throat> it's trying to teach you information about something and I'm sure you can tell it's a very similar theme to the other one this is about animals and what animals can do so um, and then again with the illustrations. so if you look carefully at the cover here you might notice that Steve Jenkins again uses that paper cutting and paper ripping technique to make all of his illustrations so all those details just come from special paper that he uses, so pretty amazing. So now we've talked about how this is a Steve Jenkins and Robin Page book. We've talked about how this is an informational nonfiction. So now I'm gonna invite you to take a moment to think about what we might learn from this book. So what might this book be all about? How many ways can you catch a fly? So take a second to think for yourself or talk with your family next to you about what might this book be all about. And parents, if you're doing this together, feel free to pause so you have more time to talk together because this kind of thinking is really important. So what might you learn in this book? What might this book be all about? How many ways can you catch a fly? Now, normally if I'm teaching, I'd be getting some ideas from students. We'd listen to each other, we'd turn and talk. So the chance to talk about your thinking is really important. So here we go. How many ways can you catch a fly? <clears throat> How many ways? Now look at that. Isn't that interesting? Already there's something different. How many ways can you catch a fly is the title. But now that we're here on the title page, the whole question isn't there. Now it just says, how many ways? That's starting to make me wonder what this book might be about. <clears throat> so let's read a little bit and we'll check back in with what our prediction was. Can you catch a fly? All animals must find food to stay alive. Most have to avoid being eaten themselves. <clears throat> Others may need to make shelters or build nests. And some are trying to hatch their eggs and protect their young. There are millions of different kinds of animals. <clears throat> Excuse me. And they have come up with some ingenious, which means really clever, solutions to these problems. See if you can figure out how the animals in these pages will snare a fish, hatch an egg, use a leaf, catch a fly, dig a hole, or eat a clam. If you'd like more information about these animals, you can find it at the back of the book. <clears throat> now, I don't know if you caught that, but the authors gave us some clues to answer our prediction about what we might learn in this book or what this book might be about. So let's do a little close read and go back and look at those words again. So it t the first sentence, all animals must find f or catch food to stay alive. That goes right with what the, the first sentence talks about. How many ways can you catch a fly? So, so far, my prediction about the book being about catching food, it all works. But then it talks about they have to avoid being eaten. They may need to build nests, raise their young, protect themselves. And it talks about how they have ingenious solutions to these problems. So already what I thought the book was about is starting to change a little bit. So this next sentence really holds a lot of information. So I'm gonna read this one again, and I want you to think again about the question I asked you, which is what we might learn in this book, what might this book be about? 
See if you can figure out how the animals in these pages will snare a fish, hatch an egg, use a leaf, catch a fly, dig a hole, or eat a clam. So take a second, think to yourself, or talk with your family. What's different now about what you think the book's going to be about? So I know my thinking has already changed. I thought the book was just going to be about <clears throat> catching catching their food, but already there's some clues in here that making me think it might be about some other things too. So we'll check back in with this question when the book is over. So let's read a little bit and see. <clears throat> How many ways can you snare a fish? Fish are slippery, quick, and good at escaping danger, but they have clever enemies and most face the constant threat of being eaten by other animals. Now, right away, this down here reminds me of some of the pages in our previous book where they showed us the parts of the animals before they talked about them. Remember that? So I'm wondering if maybe this is their way of giving us a hint about what's coming. So let's find out. There's a little fish. Somebody, now we're gonna figure out ways to catch a fish. And look, doesn't that look familiar? Let's go back to the previous book. This is what it looked like. And now look at this one. So right away you might notice something about how Steve Jenkins and Robin Page organized their books. So let's read a little bit. A diving beetle can breathe underwater from a bubble of air trapped beneath its wings. It seizes a fish with its hind legs and devours it with its powerful jaws. I bet you didn't know some beetles catch fish. This one does. <clears throat> the anhinga dives underwater for fish or stalks them in the shallows. It stabs a fish with its sharp bill, tosses it into the air, and swallows it head first. A salmon swims upstream to lay their eggs and a grizzly bear waits. It stands in the rapids and grabs fish in mid air as they leap from the water. As a group of dolphins circles beneath a school of fish, each dolphin blows a stream of bubbles the fish crowd together <clears throat> inside the bubble net, and the dolphin swims straight up through the fish, snapping them up left and right. Now this is actually similar to humpback whales. They do something very similar. They make a ring of bubbles to sort of get fish to group together. The electric eel uses special organs along its body to produce a powerful jolt of electricity that can stun or kill its prey. Now, if you've ever been to the aquarium and seen the electric eel, you've seen that uh, electricity yourself, probably. The mata, oh, let's see, mata, mata, the mata, mata <laughs> rests on the bottom of a lake or stream. When a fish comes near, it sticks out its neck, opens its mouth, and expands its throat. The sudden suction pulls the fish into its mouth. So suction is a hard thing to explain, but if you imagine, you know, using a straw, and when you suck up, it pulls the water up the straw. So that's kind of the same idea. They open their mouth and that pulling action brings the water in and that creates a pull that pulls the fish in too. <clears throat> Sorry, I've got a little bit of a throg in my, frog in my throat today. So, so far, this goes right along with that question. How many ways can you catch a fly? But this time it was how many ways can you catch a fish? So it's sort of the same idea, right? Catching food. Let's see if the next question follows that same pattern too. How many ways can you hatch an egg? So take a second to think. You can use the pictures that are down here as a hint, or you can think about animals you know already yourself. What animals do you know that lay eggs and how do they hatch them? Take a second to think. 
<clears throat> so I know I'm thinking of birds. I'm thinking of frogs. Turtles. I don't know. Maybe you can think of more. Many animals reproduce by laying eggs. Some try to gear to guarantee that they will have surviving offspring by laying, th laying thousands, even millions of eggs. Most of the eggs won't make it, but chances are at least a few will hatch. Other animals produce only a few eggs, but take better care of them, sometimes in surprising ways. So there, there that is, there's that technique again, right? That cut paper, the light's starting to fade now, so it's harder to see. The white tern lives in the islands with few predators, so it doesn't bother to make a nest. It lays a single egg, that means one egg, out in the open, often balanced on a tree branch. Earwigs are amongst the few insects that take care of their eggs. A mother earwig curls her body around her eggs to keep them safe and constantly licks them to keep them moist and clean. Imagine that, licking your eggs. This one is always a little bit surprising, so prepare yourselves. <clears throat> a mother Suriname toad lays her eggs and the father places them on his skin, uh, sorry, on the skin of her back. There in small pits, tadpoles hatch from the eggs. After a few months, the tadpoles have become little toads and they push their way out. So if you can see the details in that illustration, there are those little tiny toads hatching out of her back. Almost all mam mammals give birth to live young. The echidna is an exception. The mother lays eggs, placing them in a pouch in her belly. Young echidna, known as puggles, spend several weeks in the pouch after hatching. The ichneumon wasp lays its eggs inside a caterpillar. When the eggs hatch, the wasp larvae eat the caterpillar from the inside out. The mother Polynesian megapode buries her eggs in the ash of a volcanic crater. The heat of the volcano keeps them warm until they hatch. That's pretty clever. So that's it for this page. Now, did you notice that this one wasn't about catching food? So this one really doesn't go with that pattern that we thought about catching food. This really is a change. Let's see what the next one is. How many ways can you use a leaf? Take a second to think, what animals do you know that use a leaf and how do they use it? What do they do with it? Now again, families, if you're doing this together, you can pause the video and really talk together, brainstorm those ideas, because the more you think about what you already know, the better uh, a book will be for that, for that thinking experience. Leafy green plants cover much of the earth. Leaves are important to both plants and animals because they can make food from sunlight, air, and water. Many animals eat leaves, but some creatures have found more unusual uses for them. So here's that hint down below, and I need to remember to bring you back here to check and see if this matches the hint of those animals there. <clears throat> Using her sharp beak and silk from a spider's web, a tailor bird sews a leaf into a pouch that will hold her nest and eggs. Leaf cutting ants snip leaves into pieces and carry them to their nest. There, the leaves are used to grow a fungus. 
that is farmed in underground chambers. This fungus becomes food for the ants. The capuchin monkeys rub their bodies with the leaves of certain trees. They probably do this to keep insects away, as well as to make them smell good to other monkeys. When white tent bats need a place to sleep, they bite through the ribs of a leaf in several places. The sides of the leaf droop down, turning into a tent. Can you see that? Stepping from one lily pad to another, the lily trotter can walk over the surface of a pond without even getting its toes wet. One more. The orangutan lives in the rainforest. To stay dry, it sometimes uses a large leaf as an umbrella. So let's check back to those hints we got at the beginning. Did they match? Let's see, there's the capuchin here, the capuchin monkey, the orangutan, the leaf cutter ants, the bats, yep. It looks like they're all here. So those pictures give us a hint about the animals we're gonna learn about. So did you know about any of these? The ways animals use leaves? Some of those were a surprise to me. Maybe to you too. Let's see what's next. Actually, you know what? Let's check something. Way back here at the beginning, on that first page, it gave us a list. Let's see if that matches so far. See if you can figure out how the animals in these pages will snare a fish, hatch an egg, use a leaf. Those are the ones we've read so far. So, so far this list is matching. Let's read what else is in the list so we know what's coming. Catch a fly, dig a hole, or eat a clam. So I'm thinking the next three questions they're gonna ask are about digging a hole, um, catching a fly, and eating a clam. So let's see if that's true. Yeah, there it is. How many ways can you catch a fly? So there are the clues down below. I gotta get this oriented right for you, there you go. So looking at those pictures, think about what you know. What are some animals you know that catch flies and how do they do it? Talk together or just think to yourself if you're by yourself. Families, if you need to talk longer, you can pause. Here we go. Flies are fast. They can hover, so that means like fly in one place. They can fly backwards and walk upside down. Their eyes are watch for danger and their lightning fast reflexes help them escape it. Flies are found almost everywhere on earth, but to catch one, you've got to be very quick, very tricky, or both. That's a good clue. Quick, tricky, or both. Then, oh, this side. The net casting spider weaves a square web. Do you see it right there between its legs? Which, it's hold, which it holds by the corners as it waits, hanging upside down. When a fly walks below, the spider stretches the net wide and pushes it down over its victim. A rainbow trout leaps completely out of the water to snatch a fly that ventures too close to the surface. Oh, we need the whole book for this next one. Look, that stretches all the way over here. Can you guess how this animal catches its fly? Let's read. The Jackson's chameleon has a sticky tongue one and a half times the length of its body. It can snap up a fly in less time than it takes you to blink. We blink pretty fast, so if they can catch a fly that fast, that's fast. A slender loris moves carefully through the trees. 
It approaches its prey stealthily. Stealthily means like sneaky. It approaches its prey stealthily and extends its long, thin arms. When it's close enough, the loris lunges. That means like reaches out fast and grabs the fly with both hands. The assassin bug stalks its prey and spears it. So I don't know if you can see here. There's like this long, thin spike coming out of its head. It spears a fly with, its, uh, with a swift stab of its poisonous sword-like beak. The acrobatic chimney swift uses its aerial skills. So acrobatic, if you picture people in the circus doing tumbles or in gymnastics doing tumbles and jumps, that's what acrobatic means. So these acrobatic chimney swifts, so if you picture that, they're tumbling, spinning around. The acrobatic chimney swift uses its aerial skills to catch and eat thousands of flies and other airborne insects a day. This bird spends nearly its entire life in the air, eating, drinking, and even sleeping in flight. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm having a hard time picturing how it eats, drinks, and sleeps while flying. That's amazing. Okay, so we said that the next three would be catching a fly, eating a clam, and there was one other. I think that's the next one. Let's see what the next one was. That's right, digging a hole. Turn and talk or take a, f a minute to think for yourself. What are some animals you know that dig holes? How do they do it? Why do they do it? Animals dig into mud and rock and dirt to make homes, escape from enemies, or find food. They've evolved many different ways of making holes, often using body parts that are especially adapted for digging. So that means these animals that dig holes, their body's made for it. So they have special features or parts of their body made just to do that. So let's see what they are. Do you recognize any of these creatures down below here? Let's see. So the worm lizard looks like a large earthworm, but it's actually a lizard with no legs. This reptile makes tunnels by driving its wedge-like, so that means like a triangle shape, wedge-like. Driving its wedge-like head, a wedge-shaped head into the earth. The red rock urchin wears away the rock or coral of the seafloor with its teeth. Occasionally, the urchin grows too large to get out of the hole it has made, and it must remain in it for the rest of its life. Look at that one. The burrowing parrot uses its beak whoops, to dig nesting holes in cliffs of rock. The prairie mole cricket has front legs shaped like shovels. With them, it digs a Y-shaped burrow that acts like a loudspeaker, amplifying the cricket's mating call. The Mexican burrowing toad digs into the mud with its large back feet, moving in a spiral. That's like a corkscrew. Moving in a spiral as it burrows, the toad sucks in air as it digs, inflating its body like a balloon and pushing out the mud walls of its hole. The aardvark may be the fastest digger in the animal world. It uses its strong front legs and large claws, oh, long claws, to make underground burrows, sometimes excavating a new hole each night. It's a lot of digging. Okay, so at the beginning, we said there was one more left. Do you remember what that last question was? I think it was something about eating a clam. Let's see if that's true. <clears throat> How many ways can you eat a clam? So think about animals that you know. Whoops, there you go. 
that eat clams and how they do it. A clam holds the two halves of its shell together with powerful muscles. The shell itself is tough and hard. Additionally, most clams live buried in sand or mud and aren't too easy to spot. Many animals like to eat clams, however, and they've devised ingenious ways of finding them and getting to the soft creature inside. So I don't know if you've ever tried to open a clam that has not been cooked, but they are very, very strong and their shell is very, very thick and hard. So you have to be really creative to find a way to do that. Okay, sorry my computer just turned off for a second. All right, let's see about the clams. The club-shaped foot of the marine, uh, the man mantis shrimp delivers a quick, let me try this all again. The club-shaped foot of the mantis shrimp delivers a kick with such force that it can shatter, which means break into a lot of pieces, a clam shell. The same kick can break the glass wall of an aquarium. Wow. Don't keep those guys in your tank then. The whelk, uses a special tool to drill a hole through the clam shell, killing it. The whelk then sucks the clam's body from the shell. With its long fingers and sharp claws, raccoons pry open a clam shell. So to pry open means using a lot of force and pulling it apart. So I don't think I'd be strong enough to do that. So they must have really strong fingers. The bat ray, uses its wings to fan away the sand and mud of the seafloor. When it uncovers a clam, the ray crush, crushes its shell with its powerful jaws and spits out the pieces. A sea star wraps its arms around a clam. With hundreds of tiny suction cups, it pulls apart the clam until it's exhausted and opens its shell. Next, the sea star pushes its own stomach so the sea star pushes its own stomach out of its body and right into the clam shell and digests the clam inside its shell. It's hard to picture, but it's pretty amazing. Last one here. A herring gull picks up a clam and carries it high into the sky. It drops the clam repeatedly. So that means over and over and over onto the rocks or pavement until the shell shatters. So did you know any of these already? I know I've seen this one before, but a lot of the others were surprises. So when we first started, and that's the end, and the next part is that same thing like we saw in our previous book, right? That more information at the back, same method. So when we first began, we thought this might be about all the different ways animals catch their food. And did it end up being like that? It was a little bit different, wasn't it? So I hope that you enjoyed that, that book. I keep wanting to say story, but it's not a story. It's a book. Um, and I want you to take a second now that you, we have read both of these. What I'd like you to do together is talk about how were these books the same and how were they different? So I'm actually not gonna wait. I'm gonna go right on to my next question. So pause here and talk together. How were they the same and how are they different? The books, right? How did these authors make these books the same and how do they make them different? So pause, talk about that. And then I have one more question for you. So what, the last question about these would be, what could you say about Steve Jenkins and Robin Page? What are some things they do as authors and illustrators in the books that we've been reading? We're gonna read one more from them for now, for number three, and then we'll try a different author. So what could you say about these authors? Pause here and discuss, 
And then I'm going to show you a few. So I'm going to show you some things I want you to notice about these authors. So make sure you discuss first. So after you've discussed things that are really important to notice is one pattern that my students have noticed in the past is that a lot of times this books are guided by questions. So how many ways can you catch a fish? How many ways can you hatch an egg? And the other book was much the same. What do you do with a tail like this? What do you do with eyes like these, right? So they're guided by real questions um, to, that they then answer. Another trend you might notice about these books is they give you some clues, right? In this book, in what do you do with a tail like this, they give you a hint of the body parts. And then in the other book, they give you a little illustration at the bottom to get you thinking. Another pattern you might notice is that more information section at the back where they give you a chance to read a little bit more about each of the animals they mention. Another thing you noticed is something I have pointed out to you, which is about the way they do their illustrations. So Steve Jenkins cut all those little papers. Oh, I wish you could see better. I need more light. So if you can tell there, look at each one of those spikes is a little piece of paper that he cut out and glued in together to make that illustration. Pretty incredible. And think about all the tiny details in these pictures that he's done just by cutting paper. And lastly, I think probably the most obvious thing, probably I should have started with this one, is that so far they're really talking about animals, um, their parts of their body and their behavior. So we'll read one more book thinking about those predictions and see if that pattern continues in the next book or not. So thank you for joining me. I hope these are helping make your at-home learning time a little bit more manageable. I'm happy to keep sharing ideas with you and I hope you enjoy. Thanks.